questions and he does it consumes. Is it all you can think about? Can I be obedient to the Lord? What must I do? What must I do to be right with God? To honor God with my life? Does that consume your heart? Are you caught up in this world? And the things of this world? The righteous will live by faith. As Paul said. You will live by faith. Now look at verse 18 with me. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now here, God's wrath is revealed in the gospel. I think it can be a major mistake if we neglect the severe side of Christ Jesus' teaching. Jesus spoke of hell twice as often as He spoke of heaven. We see that Paul chooses here to present the bad news of human sin and God's wrath before He presents the good news of the gospel and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, here in verse 18, Paul states that God's wrath is revealed from heaven for three reasons. There are three reasons that God is revealing His wrath from heaven. First of all, God's wrath is revealed because of human godlessness. God's wrath is revealed from heaven because of human godlessness. Now, the inexcusableness of godlessness is Paul's first major topic this epistle. The Bible never makes any attempt to prove the existence of God. Did you know that? The Bible never makes any attempt to try to prove the existence of God. God's Word begins with that grand statement, In the beginning, God created. God's existence is self-evident. And according to Scripture, it's taken for granted. And in Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1, the person who says differently is simply called a fool by God. If you say that there's no God, you're called a fool by God. And the rejection of God in the form of atheism is not that a man cannot believe so much as that he will not believe. That is the rejection of God. Not that man cannot believe, but that he will not believe. And of course, God's anger is kindled against those who deny Him. God's anger is kindled against those who ignore Him. And God's anger is kindled against those who resist Him. So first, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against human godlessness. Secondly, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against human unrighteousness. Remember, righteousness is a right relationship with God. Unrighteousness is a wrong relationship with God. Godlessness is chiefly a sin against God. And unrighteousness is also a sin against your fellow man. Unrighteousness is the condition of not being straight with God and not being straight with your fellow man. Adam and Eve sin separated man from God. Cain's murder of Abel, his brother, separated man from man. God hates man's wrong treatment of his neighbor, of his fellow man, as he hates man's wrong treatment of his creator. Now think about that wrong treatment of your fellow man. I think that displays your treatment of God. If you say to me, well, Paul, I have a problem with my fellow man. I can love God, but I can't love my fellow man. And you can't love God. Do you understand that? If you don't love your fellow man, you are unrighteous before God. And you don't love your Creator. But Paul, I go to school. But when I go to school, I see those people there and I can't stand them. I don't like them. And you have a wrong relationship with your fellow man. You are unrighteous. You go to work and say, Paul, I have trouble with everybody at work. I can't get along with them. Then you're not right with God. Do you understand that? You should have a right relationship with your fellow man. And you also have a right relationship with your Creator. And thirdly, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against human unbelief. Paul said, people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now God will hold each person accountable for certain basic truths about himself and the intentional rejection of these truths in unbelief. Now think about evolution. Think about these uh, places that we set up. We have these plays, these museums. And in these museums, there are displays. And sometimes they'll take one tooth and they'll create a whole man out of that one tooth. And they'll tell you, well, this was uh, Nebraska man, whatever it may be. And of course, that's a lie and they know it. They know evolution's a lie, but they will continue to propagate this lie before you. You cannot walk in nature, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and not see a creator unless you are a fool 
You have to be a fool. Very unlogical in your thinking. Because if you're logical in your thinking, you cannot accept evolution, biology. It would make you a fool before God. Last week, we looked at the first 16 verses. Now, that alone, the verses 17 and 18, have introduced Paul and his wonderful message to us. Now, the rest of Romans will be an expansion of this introduction. Now, moving right along, verses 19 and 20, we have willful blindness among the lost people or the pagan. Now, missionaries point out to us that you don't find atheists among heathen tribes. Did you know that? You won't find an atheist among heathen tribes. That there have never been found, no matter how large, no matter how small the tribe, no matter how wicked the people, there has not been a, a, a tribe found that doesn't have some form of God or some system of worship. Missionaries say that it seems within these tribes that the people realize that they have sinned. They realize that they're sinners. And they seem to understand that their sins must be punished. And these tribe members seem to fear punishment as well as death, as most people everywhere do. And these tribes who know that sin must be atoned for, it must be paid for, and they seek ways of appeasing their angry deities. Now back to our scripture here. Now in verse 19 we see God's presence is unmistakable. Verse 19 since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. So what's known about God is evident because He's shown it to you. So Paul's first point here is that lost heathen is not without evidence of God's presence. And according to Scripture, all nations come from one original family. It makes logical sense that all nations once had some knowledge of the truth originally given to mankind. Archaeologists and historians, both in their respective professions, have to come to terms with the fact that the different groups, the different peoples throughout time, all of history, have some system of sacrifice in their religions. It seems that there are sufficient similarities that exist that demonstrate a common origin in a God-given revelation to the human race just after the fall. And of course, I'm talking about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were our common ancestors. Adam and Eve, their fall in the garden as they took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil when God told them not to do it. And God cast them out of the garden. And of course, we know that they would pass down to the generations what God expected in their lives. And we know the first sacrifice that was ever made, God killed an animal there in the garden, the first thing to die. And God covered their nakedness. He covered their sin with the skins of this animal. And of course, they would have passed that on to their children. Didn't take long for this to be corrupted. We know that Cain did not want to abide by God's way of sacrifice. The original soil would have been corrupted and perverted as mankind lapsed more and more into paganism. And this was reflected in the systems of sacrifice prevailing among the polytheistic neighbors of Israel. And as Israel became a nation, and as they're in the promised land, they see all of those nations around them, the peoples around them, uh, sacrificing, but they were sacrificing in a way that was corrupted and perverted. Many of them were sacrificing their own children. So we see here, so God's presence is unmistakable. Now in verse 20, we see that God's presence is universal. There's the witness of creation. We notice God's presence, His existence, through His creation. Verse 20, Paul declares, From the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what He has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So first of all, all people are exposed to the witness of creation, to the witness of nature. It is the expectation of God that mankind learns from the creation truth. Truth of His eternal power and truth of God. The proper end of understanding of these two truths should evoke a desire to praise God and to please God. Psalm 19 affirms that. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of His hand. It goes on to say there is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. The heavens declare the glory of God. 